Welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Oscar Isaac with Green Green Rocky Road. And you might recognize that song if you have seen Inside Lewin Davis, um, which I did recently at the Poly, and I have to say I've been listening to this soundtrack ever since, so this might not be the first song, uh, the, or the last song, I should say, that you hear me play from this particular album. And the reason I've chosen that one to start us off today is that I want to think about something um, kind of green in the ecosystem sense of the term. And this is a good time, I think, of the year to start thinking about the green lifestyle because now that it's a bit warmer and a bit sunnier, a lot of us are heading outside. And there is an interesting new paper out this week about uh, how we can go about studying the links between nature and culture and health. And this is a topic that I have kind of addressed before on the show. I've talked about a few studies that have looked into these sorts of things. But most of these studies have looked at nature and health, and they've not really thought about how culture mediates those potential health benefits of nature. And that is the real uh, difference with this particular paper, is that it thinks about how culture is something that enables us to appreciate certain aspects of nature or that facilitates our use of nature, our exploration of nature in a particular way or in a particular place. And so that is what allows nature to have certain effects on us. And the other really interesting thing about this paper is that it was written by some researchers who are based right here in Cornwall. And they're based at an institution that you might not even be aware of, and that is um, the medical institute over in Truro that's a part of the University of Exeter and it used to be part of this kind of combined enterprise here on the, the peninsula and now it's its own thing that's a part of the University of Exeter and a lot of people at Exeter don't even remember most of the time that we have this medical school down here uh, and that they have this whole European Center for Human Health that looks into these sorts of things. So this is a really nice chance to plug uh, my colleagues over there and to let you guys know that there is this facility here in Cornwall just up the road from us um, and to give a little bit of recognition to the work that they've been doing because it is quite interesting. And this particular new study that they've written, it's actually classified as an opinion piece in a, a journal. And the opinion is kind of that we need to start thinking about these links in different ways. And we need to come up with a new framework so that we can study these sorts of things that we haven't typically studied in the past. So in the paper, they kind of talk about these sorts of general trends that we see, these patterns between humans, uh, human health and natural aspects of the world. So whether that means going out and, and doing recreation or enjoying a particular thing that you see out in your environment or whatever the case might be, they kind of talk about these links that we know of, think about how culture might mediate some of those, and then discuss in more detail how we might go about studying all of this in more detail. So as I said, I have talked about this a little bit in the past on the show, so you might recognize some of these things that I start off with as I give you a bit of background. Uh, the same background that the authors present in their paper. So the first thing that they point out is that biodiversity has been important to humans for millions of years, and this goes beyond just the fact that we need to have biodiversity and, and nature outside our door for basic things like food and materials for building and shelter and that sort of thing. So even beyond these basic needs, we pay attention to nature and we pay attention to biodiversity because of the symbolic significance of many of these things. So for example, emblems that we're interested in, you know, things that represent us as families or as nations or as a team. You might have a, a team mascot that's an animal, for example. Also, these things are important in figures, as figures in myths and legends and also religious texts. So there are a lot of particular species that have real importance in a lot of mythology. So for example, in the Christian mythology, you've got things like goldfinches and pelicans and vultures, all sorts of birds, for example, that have real significance because they are associated with various aspects of the story of Jesus. And so this is not just true in Christianity or in the West, but all around the world in all sorts of different religions and different cultures. And all these types of cult cultural significance can provide what the authors call a pathway through which biodiversity is linked to human health. So because we appreciate these things for a particular reason that's associated with our cultural values, that is what allows us to connect with them in nature and then derive some benefit from that connection, from uh, those experiences that we have outdoors. And these kind of general patterns have been recognized 
when people have done previous uh, kind of ecosystem assessments, whether they're assessments on a global level or a national level or even a local level. And people do often refer to these potential benefits, but they don't really talk about them in much detail or really offer any sort of research. They just say that they're aware that these things are out there, and then they don't really take it any further. And of course, scientists are really interested in having some sort of quantitative thing so they can really explore those things and understand why it is that these connections are made. And that is what the authors are saying we really need to start making more of an attempt of doing. And in particular, what they're interested in is thinking about how human health could be affected by the presence or by the ex uh, exposure to biodiversity. And if it is affected in some way, um, you know, Theoretically, you would think that there would be a positive benefit of biodiversity. Then on the other hand, you might also see a negative impact of the loss of biodiversity, which is something that we are experiencing now uh, with these very high levels of extinction rates. And so you might begin to worry that not only could we be missing out on certain ecosystem functions, uh, you know, like water purification and uh, pollination of flowers and things like that, but there also might be medical functions that we might be missing out on if these species start to go extinct. So what are some signs of our positive relationship with nature? Well, you probably all can think of a few of these anyway because you likely have at some point in the past gone outside, done something, even just looked out your window and felt kind of nice because you were able to see a landscape or a certain species or you know something out there that grabbed your attention and, and made you kind of smile. And in fact, you are not alone if, if you have experienced something like that because humans in general tend to spend both a lot of time and a lot of money enabling themselves to experience nature. And that is true in terms of going out on trips, um, buying bird seed to go into bird feeders, um, spending money on conservation efforts in order to set aside land that can be accessed later on for some sort of beneficial use. All sorts of things that we do, we put our time and energy into to protect these spaces so that we can have these experiences. And we also enjoy a variety of experiences. So there are things that are kind of remote. Many of us like to sit and watch um, you know, nature on TV. So for example, David Attenborough documentary, or you might be watching Cosmos recently. I just watched it last night myself. So things like that. I mean, obviously, in terms of Cosmos, you're not going to be able to go out and experience a lot of the stuff that he's talking about because it is so far away. Uh, and that's even true of things that are about, you know, Australia or Africa or maybe places that you won't ever get to travel. So a lot of people are able to appreciate nature from afar. But then there are also more direct encounters that you might have. So if you go out hiking, if you go out camping, even if you just like to go out gardening on the weekends, all of these sorts of things can again give you a way to appreciate nature. And one of the interesting trends that the authors refer to is the fact that even though we are kind of experiencing some economic problems lately, the membership of humans in environmental groups continues to rise. Now this might be you know, kind of related to the fact that we're aware of the conservation problems that we're having, and so a lot of us feel compelled to join these groups to try to make a difference. But what's interesting is that even though joining often does cost some money, cost some money, uh, people are doing it despite the fact that they might need that money for other stuff as well. So clearly there is a real drive here for humans to make this connection and kind of make this pledge to help out nature. And we also find trends um, showing that global wildlife tourism is really popular. It's actually as popular as regular types of international tourism. So people are going out of their way to go see wildlife and experience nature. We also know that there are increasing rates at which people are participating in citizen science projects. And this suggests that they are appreciating and investing in local biodiversity. So cumulatively, all of these patterns kind of suggest that there is, you know, a, a real importance of nature to most people around the world. Now, the next question that the authors ask is how this culturally mediated value, as they refer to it, will be affected by biodiversity loss, and how could that impact human well-being and health? So as I mentioned earlier, we do have really high rates of extinction right now, something like 100 to 1,000 times greater and natural background levels. And this indicates that, of course, humans have had a significant and negative impact on wildlife because it is this kind of human influence that seems to be making these levels much higher than they used to be. 
And given the importance of biodiversity in culture, the loss of species could have really significant repercussions for well-being. It can lead to anxiety and frustration and stress. Um, this is true whether it's something that you're you know, actively thinking about. So if you sit around stressing about whether you can order this particular fish off of the menu at a restaurant because it's being overfished or whether you should have something else, uh, or whether you're just kind of unconsciously noticing that there is a loss of wildlife around you and now things don't look quite as vibrant as they used to and that's a bit sad. So it doesn't really matter exactly how you're appreciating these things, just the fact that you are kind of on some level noticing these patterns, this could begin to have an impact on you. And currently there is no real framework in terms of a kind of a scientific method for exploring these potential patterns. And that, as I said earlier, is why the authors drafted this particular paper, because they want to help researchers kind of think about these connections that might be important to make, and think about how it is that they can explore those things in a quantitative, rigorous, scientific way. And in particular, they want to help researchers explore the pathways and highlight their possible importance for biodiversity conservation and public health. And I'm quoting directly from the authors there. So what is the potential importance of cultural pathways for human health? Let's get a little bit more specific and not just think about kind of these warm, fuzzy feelings that a lot of us tend to have when we think about nature. Well, we know that cultural associations can cause even minor stimuli to have significant impacts on human health. So right now I'm not talking about the direct link between nature and health, but we're kind of doing step-by-step, -step, building up uh, an explanation of how we could have this this link. So the first step in the process is to think about why it is that cultural associations in general could have any impact on human health. And we do know that this is the case. So for example, there have been some really interesting studies on how human awareness of certain things, certain factors, can have implications for whether uh, medications, for example, have a real impact on people when they're taking them to treat something. So, for example, we tend to have cultural associations with the color blue and the color red. And so when pills are those colors, then we tend to go into a treatment thinking, well, this is likely to work. This is more likely than something else to work. So, for example, because we here in the West tend to think of blue as a kind of a calm, quiet color, antidepressant pills often are uh, kind of a pale blue, because that suggests that these are things that are going to kind of help us calm down and relax and feel a bit happier. And those are also true of, of drugs that are kind of meant to, you know, potentially treat ADHD or something like that, where you want to just have a, a calmer level of being. On the other hand, if you want something that's kind of a stimulant, those are often red, because these are colors that indicate energy and excitement. And so when people take medications that are those colors, then they're already going to kind of have a, a placebo type effect often uh, that will start working on them because they see that color and already begin to feel that that medicine is definitely going to work. So this is a good thing that, you know, to kind of indicate that just that one little cultural association of what a color means, what it indicates, that can go on to affect our somatic uh, sense and what happens with our bodies. And so that right there goes to you know, it's a lot of evidence suggesting that there could be this connection between our cultural associations with nature and what's actually happening outside our doors. And of course it is important to note that these sorts of patterns are going to vary both geographically, geographically and temporally because not all cultures will have the same associations and those associations might change within a culture over time. So you have to kind of pay attention to these things and think about the scale over which these patterns are going to apply. Now we also know that mental health is negatively affected by awareness of environmental degradation. And this is something I think I have talked about on the show in the past. Um, so for example, the, the, the case that the authors talk about is how when droughts occur and also when floods occur, you tend to have a lot of depression and people that have to suffer through that and see it outside. And this is not just because it has financial and industrial impacts. It's not because this means that you know, you're a farmer and you've just lost your job because your crops have all flooded or they've all wilted in a drought. This goes beyond that and is actually found also in people who don't make their living from the land, who have no direct uh, 
anything directly to lose from these cultural, or, sorry, from these environmental events, but because of the kind of cultural implications, uh, the widespread implications of those things, and because of the way it looks maybe and the way it feels, that does go on to impact their mental health. And there's ample evidence that both mental and physical health are positively affected by contact with natural spaces as well. And this is another thing I've talked about on the show because we do have some researchers uh, up on the Penryn campus of the University of Exeter studying this sort of thing as well. So there are lots of people here in Cornwall who are particularly interested in these issues and actually study it around here sometimes. So you guys might find yourselves um, study subjects at some point or another if you happen to be in the right uh, place at the right time. So for example, some of these researchers have found that uh, people who have a lot of contact with nature have fewer health problems, they have greater feelings of overall health, they have lower stress levels, they have faster recovery from illness, and some of these things are self-reported, but others are also kind of reported by people in hospitals, for example, because we do know that people who are in hospitals recovering will often recover faster if they have a nice view of nature outside their window. So some of these things are reported uh, you know, they can be influenced by someone's own feeling of experience, but they can also be real patterns that are seen from the outside by actual doctors who are watching these things happen. And this sort of stuff could stem from many things, and this could be the calming influence of the habitat, it could be the fact that people who are experiencing nature are out there experiencing it beca because they're exercising, so while they're exercising, so the fact that it offers you a space for exercise is actually what's beneficial. Sometimes people who find themselves outdoors end up running into other people and making friends, and it might be those kind of social connections that make nature kind of the link between uh, the outdoors and happiness. It's kind of hard to say without any further research. There are lots of mechanisms by which this effect could happen. And again, the benefits can result from direct contact, but also from indirect contact. So like I said, you know, looking out the window and seeing a nice view. And most studies that examine these sorts of patterns tend to treat all natural spaces similarly. And they don't really look at the specific characteristics within each habitat that may have led to the benefits. So are we talking about any green space or are we talking about a national park versus the little um, you know, garden down the street from your house? Is it talking about an allotment or you know, a day at the beach? And all of these things vary quite widely. They might have different... Uh, they, might, they might cover different areas of space, they might have different biodiversity uh, qual qualities, they might have different social qualities, all sorts of things can vary, so it's really hard to generalize, and yet that's, that's what people have, do it, have been doing. They've been making these really broad conclusions without really thinking about all the little components that make up these spaces. And so this is one of the things that we really have to think about, and we also have to think about um, how it is that we can control the role of cultural pathways or directly investigate them in a rigorous way. So are we going to keep looking at the same sorts of places over and over again? So in the past we tend to look at Western developed nations. Uh, or are we going to try to broaden out and, and look across all sorts of different countries, all sorts of different cultures, and draw some conclusions across all humans in general? Are we going to look at actual biodiversity in each of these places, or are we just going to think about whether there are species or not, or whether there are certain types of species, so, you know, maybe birds versus mammals versus trees, or do we really care about exactly how many and, and what type? And another thing that we don't really think about is actually performing experiments to get a real idea, because as I'll talk a little bit more about later, you can have something that's kind of correlated, but doesn't mean that one thing causes another. So you really have to actually test whether there is this effect of nature on humans, or whether it's something out there that just happens to be tied to nature that's really having the effect. So we need to think about all of this stuff in a more rigorous way and figure out how we can really elucidate the pathway and make certain predictions that can then be tested so that we can really get a handle on what might be the implications if biodiversity continues to drop as it seems like it's going to do. <clears throat> Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was The Lone Bellow with Green Eyes and a Heart of Gold. And on today's show, I am thinking about the links between nature and culture and human health. 
and that is because there has been a recent paper put out by a group of researchers in Truro associated with the University of Exeter, and I thought it would be a good time to remind you all that we do have this facility here in Cornwall, since so many people don't even know about it, including people within the university itself, uh, and also because this is a time of year when a lot of us are going outside and experiencing nature, and so it's a perfect opportunity to think about what beneficial impacts that might be having on you, and what negative impacts there might be if we lose uh, bits of nature that we like to go out and explore, and if we start losing biodiversity. So before the break I was thinking about this in kind of vague terms, but now I want to get a bit more specific because the authors give some specific examples and then really start to outline their proposed framework for studying this stuff in more detail. So they have used what they refer to as an ecosystem assessment framework to consider the relationships between biodiversity, cultural pathways, and human health. And they propose that there are both direct and indirects of biodiversity on human health. And they give a few examples and a few scenarios for how this might come to be. So some of the direct effects can include things like um, the emergence and transmission of infectious diseases that might result from loss of biodiversity. And this is something that I talked about kind of recently when I was discussing David Quammen's book, Spillover. And I talked a little bit about how in some places, for example in Southeast Asia, this is happening quite a lot, where they're starting to cut down lots of forests, this makes animals move into new habitats and it exposes certain things, maybe pathogens that were in the soil, and no longer are those things being held in place in a single habitat. So these migrating animals are taking diseases to new places, they're encountering new hosts, Things that were held in the soil by the tree roots might be suddenly released into the air as it kind of dries and the dust flies around. And then those little microbes can be breathed in and they can infect animals or humans. So this is just one of the ways that you can have loss of biodiversity leading to the emergence of new diseases and spillover into humans, which obviously can be a really devastating thing because it can wipe out masses of people all in one go because we have often got naive immune systems, and so we react quite strongly to these new things. Another example, which is another kind of you know obvious and clearly direct thing, is that a lot of the stuff that we are potentially losing is important for our health. So our food, for example, or having a diversity of food sources. So even if we don't need that particular food, it might have been a nice thing to have as an alternative to something else, maybe in drought or in a really wet season, or maybe it has more of a particular vitamin that something else has, and so actually it would have been a bit better in some scenario or another. So having these sorts of things around, even if we haven't discovered them yet, so this is a thing that you hear a lot when we talk about the loss of the rainforests in the Amazon, that there are probably tons of species in there that we don't even know yet, and they might hold the key to some drug that will cure cancer, or will do some other wonderful thing. And the same is true uh, of food as well. So there might be some perfect crops in there that could really be you know, great to grow in places where we can't grow crops very well right now, or they might fill a particular niche that we're kind of uh, needing to fill, especially if one of our crops is susceptible to an insect, for example, or some kind of a pathogen. To have this thing as backup might be really perfect. So if we're losing biodiversity, then we can lose these things that might have really helped us or might actually be helping us now and we could lose them at some point in the future. And of course loss of food and anything kind of related to nutrients can not only mean that we die of starvation, which at this point is kind of unlikely, but it could happen in the future, but more importantly it could also cause health defects. And this is a thing that we actually do see now where you've got people in a particular region who maybe can only grow a certain number of crops and if something happens, if they can't rely on the things that they forage from nature, or if one of their crops is failing for some reason and they don't have all the vitamins and minerals that they need, they can then suffer very bad birth defects, which is, you know, has really problematic implications for not just now but also into the future because those are going to be children that then grow up to have kind of malnourished lives and maybe their children do as well. So it can have knock-on effects for quite a long time. Now there are also direct effects of uh, maintained biodiversity that are quite positive. So for example, we know that increased abundance can mitigate air pollution, and we've studied this a lot in cities, for example, where you've got maybe some rooftop gardens, and when, when you have those around, air quality tends to be a bit better. 
both locally and also, if you've got enough of them, over a larger landscape area as well. We also know that this goes on to have impacts on respiratory and cardiovascular health. So you might have seen that recently there have been some connections made between uh, the levels of air pollution and the cardiovascular problems that people have been having. And this is something I think I actually did talk about on the show a few weeks ago because there was a new study looking at this. So in places where we do have biodiversity cleaning up the air, we do actually tend to have fewer problems with breathing and with heart rate. Now, another thing that the authors talk about is, of course, indirect effects as well. lower rates of problems associated with uh, breathing and heart rate and heart function. Now the authors also talk about the potential indirect effects of biodiversity loss, but unfortunately these are less well studied and so they kind of have to rely on their own logic for drawing some conclusions about where these uh, links might be made. So first of all they say, they say that there are probably multiple stages during which biodiversity could indirectly affect health. The first would be that there's some sort of a change in the level of biodiversity, and this could therefore affect the provisioning of cultural goods. This would then affect the opportunities that people have to experience those goods and to realize the values of those items. And then changes in cultural values because of this could impact upon human well-being, which then would go on to affect health. And to understand this connection between biodiversity and human health a bit more in detail, they then go on and talk about each of these stages um, more specifically. So that's kind of their framework, and now they have some more details to back that up and think about why it's actually important uh, and, and probable. So the first of these stages is the, the loss of biodiversity going on to reduce the availability of cultural goods. So the goods that they're discussing here can vary quite widely. And this might be um, variation because of geographical differences or differences in the particular species in a, a particular area. It might also be um, a, a variation that comes from culture itself because of things that people are interested in or things that people have put out in their environment. But whatever the case might be, it could be something that varies from actual number of species. So if it's something that's quite easy to quantify, then this could impact people. Or it might be something that's a bit more um, difficult to quantify because it's something kind of vague, like how aesthetically pleasing an environment is. You know, is there a lot of color if you glance at it? Are there tall trees instead of little shrubs? So it can be something that's, you know, maybe you can start to quantify it in some way, but it might just be a bit vaguer. Do people tend to give it a rating of, you know, one versus a five on a scale of how attractive do you think it is? Uh, is it something that you think is beautiful or is it just kind of pretty? So these kind of things can be difficult to approach in a scientific way, but as you can already see by the ways I'm describing these qualities, there are categories that you can kind of try to break them down into in order to get an idea of, of how these aspects of nature, these goods, can actually be appreciated and studied in some way. Now, of course, biodiversity is quite easy to measure in most places. You know, scientists have been doing this for a really long time, and in many places there are actually long-term data sets because of that. So we have decades or even centuries of data telling us what species are in a place or how many species are in a place and how that varies from one time of year to another. So we actually could access those records and begin to use them in these sorts of studies. It's also a bit difficult to then take the next step and measure the causal linkages between biodiversity and health. And this is where the authors say it would be quite nice to have experimental manipulations. And in order to do this, you would have to have a diverse range of techniques at hand. So for example, if you want to associate biodiversity with recreational opportunities, so maybe you think that if you have more species out there, there are more things for you to do in the habitat, which is not necessarily a crazy idea. So for example, uh, if you like climbing trees and you also like 
bird watching and you also like hunting for mushrooms, for example, you might you know, benefit from having particular types of trees that are useful for each one of those functions. And so the more of those trees that you have, the more likely you are to be able to climb trees and watch birds and go out and collect mushrooms that are growing underneath them. So you want to have a lot of different types of trees to do all those different sorts of activities versus just maybe one species of tree that's good for climbing but not the other two things. So that's kind of a silly example, but you get the idea where you might actually have cases where having a certain amount of biodiversity could be quite useful for something like recreation or whatever thing we're interested in doing. So in order to figure that kind of thing out, you'd have to have lots of techniques. So you'd need to be able to perform ecological surveys. You might need to measure distance uh, of a particular site to nearby settlements to get an idea of how easy that place is for humans to access and actually utilize. You might need to think about the accessibility within a site. So if you've just set aside a big national park, that's great, but can people actually wander about in it? Can they actually use it for something, or is it just kind of there off limits? So there are all sorts of things that you might have to start to look at and to measure, and different types of people might have the different skills that are needed to do this. So it might need to be an interdisciplinary sort of project. Now the second stage is thinking about how fewer cultural goods would then provide less opportunity to realize and place cultural values. So if we start to lose all of these things, we might not realize how important they are to us because we're not experiencing them. And I think this is not a problem so much with people who are adults now. So we know that these things are useful. We know what it's like to experience them. So we know how important they are. It's more like uh, a problem that's associated with our children in the next few generations. Because if these people never have a chance to experience that, if they don't learn from us how important this stuff is, then they might not realize you know, that they should be fighting for it and that this is a thing that has real importance in their lives. And this is one of the reasons, reasons I think, that a lot of outreach is focused towards children these days. So the authors are saying how, you know, this might not always be the case. It might not always be that experience of nature and biodiversity, you know, leads to a realization of how important it is, but it often might be the case. And it might be kind of interesting as well. So we might say, you know, you predict that the more you experience it, the more you love nature. But it might not be that simple. There might be something more complex going on there. So you have to experience a certain threshold level. Or maybe after a certain point it kind of tapers off because it's overkill. So you never know these things until you actually study them. And we really need to get a better idea of, of this relationship and how it changes over time and from one type of person to another. And one of the things that they point out as kind of an illustration of this, you know, kind of complex nature is that sometimes the rarity of a particular species can make it more appealing, but sometimes it can also make it less appealing. So maybe you are someone who likes a challenge, and so as a hunter, you want to go out and get something that is the hardest to find. And this is something that we see in Africa, for example, where the rarest game species are the ones that people often will pay the most money to get themselves out there to find and to kill, because it is kind of a, a thrill of the hunt sort of thing. On the other hand, if you're after something, you know, again, to go back with the mushroom example, if you really want a particular species and you just kind of want it for dinner, you're not really a crazy kind of collector, you really want what's going to be easy to find, what's going to be right outside your doorstep so you can hurry up and grab some and then go take them home and cook. So it might be that for you, as that type of person, you don't like those things that are quite rare because it's too much of a pain, too much of a hassle. So the same sort of scenario could have very different implications depending on what species we're talking about, what ecosystem service we're talking about, what sort of person we're talking about. And so you have to think about uh, these sorts of things and keep in mind the fact that there often is quite a lot of variation. And again, to understand these sorts of things, you need to have uh, an interdisciplinary approach because you have to think about the financial value of goods and services, you have to talk about emotions, you have to think about policy implications. There are all sorts of things that kind of combine to uh, create the scenario in which these things have the effect that they do on human health. Now stage three is having fewer opportunities to realize and place cultural values, um, how this can have a negative impact on human well-being. So before I've kind of talked about 
all, everything up to the point of human well-being, but now the authors are thinking about, right, how does all of this set up now actually go on to affect people? And on top of the interdisciplinary questions asked in this last step, this is the place where you then have to go the next step and think about working with public health professionals and epidemiologists and all sorts of people who are involved in medicine to link the cultural values with mental and somatic health. So you have to think about things like satisfaction, self-esteem, general well-being, all sorts of things that you can actually ask someone about or maybe even measure if you have the right kind of survey tools. And it would be best if these things can be collected longitudinally, which means that you're collecting from the same people over and over again through time so that you can see how things change with them as their environments change. But it's also quite nice to have a cross-section so that at any one time you look at lots of different people and lots of different scenarios so that you have quite a lot of variety both horizontally and longitudinally. And both of these things give you a different amount of power whenever you're conducting the statistical analyses. But as the authors point out, you can't just perform observations, and I mentioned this earlier. You can find a link between two things, but you don't necessarily know that one is actually causing the other. And that's why it's good to have multiple types of study design going on simultaneously, so that you can kind of start to tease that stuff apart. And one of the things that they suggest is that you construct studies that specifically target characteristics that we already suspect of being particularly related to nature. So things like um, being able to go out and kind of meditate and reflect on things, being able to relieve stress. So all these sorts of things that you might have experienced as you're out there in nature, and we kind of know just as common knowledge are a beneficial impact of being outdoors and experiencing biodiversity. Those are the first steps that we could start taking as we make these investigations. And then later on, maybe we could think of some things that are, you know, potentially unexpected. We can explore those in more detail. Now, the fourth stage is the fact is kind of the thinking about how reduced human health, um, reduced well-being can then be detrimental to human health. Sorry. So thinking about how that kind of mental state and general kind of life situation can go on to impact human health. And we already know that psychological health can impact physical health, but we don't really have an idea of how these things are connected with measures of nature. So one of the things that the authors talk about is how we know that people who have chronic depression often will then go on to have a greater risk of heart disease and diabetes. So we know that there are these connections between mental health and somatic health. And it might be the same case that you find these sorts of patterns for depression, for example, associated with biodiversity. And again, it would be possible to what they refer to as mine long-term data sets to look for this sort of, of information. So we have all these data sets that have been collected by the government, by researchers at various institutions, and you can go out and think about things like mortality, blood pressure, the incidence of specific diseases, kind of self-reports of general health, all those sorts of things and connect those to ecological data for the same region. And that would allow you to begin to understand whether there might be some of these links between kind of mental health and physical well-being in a particular place. And again, on top of this, it might be nice not just to link this up kind of observationally, but actually going out and doing some experiments to see whether you can have an impact of the environment on humans. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was The Chieftains with The Green Fields of America. And just before the break, I was describing uh, a study in which some local researchers, people based here in, uh, in Cornwall over in Truro, were talking about uh, a framework that we can use to think about how nature impacts human health because of kind of cultural values that we place on nature. So I described the different stages that they suggest that we need to look at, um, the different steps in which this, this uh, effect of nature might come to bear on human health. And now I want to think a little bit about some of the challenges that might be associated with the studies that these guys are suggesting we need to start doing. So one of the things that they say is that the studies are essential but they're not easy. And 
one of the examples that they give, which I've kind of referred to obliquely a little bit throughout this discussion, is that you can do large-scale analyses that find really significant relationships between factors, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to say whether those factors are actually impacting each other directly. So the example that the authors give is that you can do a big study and find that bird watching and general health are significantly positively related. So you know that there is this connection somehow between bird watching and better health. So the more you bird watch, the better your health is. But the problem is that you don't really know that there is actually causation here. You just know that there's correlation. It could be that bird watching makes people healthier, which would be great. Uh, because that would be a, you know, a quick and easy way to go out and be a bit healthier. It would make me feel good since I do a lot of bird watching. But it also can mean that only healthier people go out and watch birds. It could also mean that it's true that doing more bird watching makes you healthier, but it has nothing to do with bird watching itself. It might be that if someone happens to be going outside a lot, that makes them healthier. It could be that holding binoculars up to your face makes you healthier. Now, of course, that's unlikely, but the point is that there are lots of things that you could start to uh, think about as potential actual reason for these relationships. And you actually have to do experiments, or at least lots and lots of different observations that you can then kind of put together in order to really figure out what is happening behind these patterns that you find. And so that's why the authors say that it's really important to control for a wide range of other traits beyond just those that you can yank really quickly from a, a survey, for example. And you need to also do experiments. So for example, in this case with the bird watching, you might have people spend different amounts of time bird watching, bird watching in different ways, and then see if their health varies with the amount of time that they're doing it, the way in which they're doing it, the places in which they're doing it, uh, with demographic background associated with the people who are doing it, all these sorts of things that you could look at in more detail. And surveys could be a uh, part of this. It would be quite easy to get lots of data from people who are willing to fill out these surveys, but you have to construct them really carefully because you need to avoid biases from the participants. You have to um, you have to be careful that you're not kind of letting on what it is exactly that you're studying because people will often want to fill out in a certain way because they're aware of what you're after and so they want to kind of help you get there even if they don't mean to do that, they often do. Uh, they might accidentally respond uh, more than someone else if they're doing it kind of in a group setting so they might kind of look over to someone next to them and want to compete a little bit. So there are lots of little things you have to think about as you're putting these things together. You also want to create studies that will investigate both short-term and long-term effects of nature. So maybe some of these bird watchers are people who had lots of childhood exposure to nature, but maybe some of them didn't. And does this, do these differences in background have some effect on what they're getting out of nature today or how healthy they are today, how they approach the natural habitat today? You have to think about whether these are important things to control for and if so, how can you do that? Or how can you, maybe you don't want to control for them, you actively want to study them, but you have to consider that ahead of time, otherwise your study design might be all wrong. And as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's quite important to think about this kind of threshold effect as well. So it might not be that you've got kind of a spectrum of things and as you, as you get more diverse or as you get more green, you know, some aspect of nature that you're measuring that actually has a linear impact on human health. There might be a threshold effect instead where you just have to get to a certain level and then everything's great or then everything starts to go wrong. So you have to think about different types of relationship and kind of ponder whether there might be subtle effects or um, unexpected effects that you might need to investigate in a different way than you might just look at those kind of easy linear relationships. Now ideally, the authors say that researchers in this field would create study designs that would be quite similar so that you could do the same thing in lots of different places all around the world and then begin to compare all of these data. Because really, biodiversity is a global thing. Conservation is a global thing. Human health, global. So it's nice to be able to take these kind of local patterns or even national patterns and begin to blow them up and think about how these have implications for people all around the world. Because then you can really start pooling these data and thinking about all of the significant widespread effects of uh, biodiversity change and human health. 
And one of the things that they really emphasize is the fact that in order to do these studies better, we need to get away from thinking about all green spaces as being the same. You know, urban green spaces aren't the same as forests, they aren't the same as parks, they aren't the same as a backyard garden, and you need to think about what sorts of characteristics are different among all of these, and also which characteristics are the same. So it might be that there are some similarities in terms of the effects of these places on people, but likely there are also differences, and so we have to think about kind of scale impacts or uh, characteristic impacts of each one of those and kind of differentiate. And one way that we can help do this a bit more is to actually define these terms. In a lot of studies, the authors say that people just kind of use the phrase green space or forest or woods without really talking about what it actually is. So if we kind of quantify each of these things and really describe what we mean when we use those phrases, then we can start to think about each of the patterns found in each of these places and whether that kind of comes together to make one big picture whether each of them really is different and distinct and you know what does that mean for human health and the effects that humans get from being out in those places. So to conclude, the authors say that you know all these issues that they're talking about, they aren't just relevant to conservation causes or to kind of you know tree hugger types who are feeling really friendly towards nature. They really do have implications for all of us because we are all responding, whether we know it or not to these things in our environment. And so changes to biodiversity, changes to the structure of the habitat, can actually have real implications for us in terms of both mental health and physical health. And if even that doesn't really draw you in and make you interested, the authors also point out that this has really big impacts for money as well, so for the economy, because it is very expensive to treat these conditions. And also we do lose a lot uh, in terms of productivity of people as well. And so all of these sorts of things can happen not only in people who admit that they love nature, but also in people who are kind of unaware of this connection. So it's worth kind of sharing and spreading the word a little bit that this is a thing that's really important. And it has both biological and social implications and could go on this sort of, this sort of research to have effects on politics and on economics and on healthcare practices, on all sorts of things. So it is a really good idea to think about doing more of this sort of work and using this sort of framework in order to achieve that a bit more. And these guys at the European Center for Environment and Human Health are indeed doing that, and that's one of the reasons why it is such a cool institute, because they are exploring, both locally here in Cornwall and uh, further afield, they're exploring the relationships between ecological factors and human factors and thinking about how we can use that information to make us healthier and to kind of mitigate against the potential impacts of biodiversity loss and maybe even to have better conservation practices in general. So good for them for uh, pursuing this and hopefully they can find out lots of stuff that will allow them to help us save our little Cornish um, patches of green space but also save bits further afield and hopefully you guys can keep all of that in mind as you go out on these warmer days, these longer nights uh, and kind of think about what impacts all of this nature is having on you, hopefully beneficial ones. And I believe that will be it for me this week. I'm going to finish up with Amy McDonald singing The Green and the Blue.